الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our adult viewers A very special welcome to our young and young adult viewers Welcome to the program 30 Lessons from the Life of the Last Prophet وسلم. Welcome to episode number 16 in our series The Year of Sorrow Episode 16, The Year of Sorrow Brothers and sisters, as we mentioned in the previous episode, the boycott of the Prophet, his companions, and his supporters from the two clans of Beni Hashim and Beni Muttalib, but not without taking its toll on the Prophet's number one supporter and protector, Abu Talib. By this time, the Prophet's uncle Abu Talib was 80 years old and the trying circumstances of life in the valley with insufficient food and drink caused his health to deteriorate rapidly. He became frail. He was constantly ill with one illness or another and eventually due to the severity and the compounding of illnesses he became bedridden. Bedridden for our younger listeners is a fancy word meaning that he was unable to get out of bed had to remain in bed all day and all night and be treated for his illnesses. In the month of Rajab of the 10th year, just a few months after leaving the Shib, all signs pointed to his imminent passing. The Prophet, in one last ditch effort to secure his conversion and save his uncle from punishment, the punishment which awaits the idolaters and disbelievers in Islam, the Prophet went to his bedside hoping that he could preach to him and talk to him and convince him to become a Muslim before dying. When he entered the room, he found Abu Jahl and Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah, two virulent, hostile pagans, idolaters who were virulently opposed, strongly opposed to the Prophet, strongly opposed to his message, and they were waiting there. And so when the Prophet arrived, he found them already there with his uncle. The three of them, the Prophet, Abu Jahl, and Abdullah, had the following exchange. The Prophet said to Abu Talib, My dear uncle, simply say, I testify that there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Just say these words. If you say them, I will be able to argue on your behalf with Allah on the day of resurrection. Just say these words before passing. But Abu Jahl and Abdullah, they said in reply, they countered by saying, Abu Talib, would you really consider abandoning the religion of Abdul Muttalib? And this is what's significant about this, and what you have to understand, is that in the culture of the pagan Arabs, it was considered blameworthy. It was considered a, a black mark on a person's record if they changed their religion, if they changed or followed a different religious tradition. It was basically considered that you're not only saying something is wrong, but you're also insulting your forefathers and basically saying that they were misguided. It's an insult to them. And pride in the forefathers and respecting them and honoring the ancestors was something which was very important in their culture. And so they used that as a weapon against Abdul Muttalib to, con to convince him not to become a Muslim. So the Prophet, he repeated what he said. And those who were with him, meaning the, the other two, Abu Jahl and Abdullah, they repeated what they said. They kept going back and forth. Oh, my uncle, say la ilaha illallah. And they would say, don't say it. Because if you say it, then you're saying Abdul Muttalib and his religion is false and is wrong and he's misguided, etc. You'll be insulting your forefathers. So they would say that and the Prophet would say what he had said. And ultimately, Abu Talib, he settled the argument by saying that he would die upon the religion of Abdul Muttalib. And he refused to testify that there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah. He refused to say, La ilaha illallah. And once he said that, I refuse to say it, I'm going to die upon the religion of the Muttalib, he breathed 
his last. Even though he had repeatedly told people openly that he believed that the prophet was telling the truth and that his message was true. He told people that. So in his heart he knew that the prophet was telling the truth, but he refused out of pride and fear of being shamed. He refused to say it before passing. And so he said those words, I follow the religion of Abdul Muttalib, and he breathed his last. The prophet, visually shaken and overcome with emotion, proclaimed, I swear by Allah, I will continue to pray for you and pray for your pardon until I am forbidden from doing so. So the Prophet, upon leaving the apartment with his uncle having died right there in front of him, he was shaken by that and he made it, he said, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that Allah will forgive you. Even though you didn't, you didn't say the Shahada, I pray that Allah will accept my prayer and not let you be punished. But as soon as the Prophet said that or shortly thereafter, Allah revealed the following words. مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا أُولِي قُرْبَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيْنْ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أصحاب الجحيم. It is not proper for the Prophet nor for those who believe to ask Allah's forgiveness for the idolaters even though they be their kinsmen, their relatives after it has become clear to them that they are dwellers of the fire because they died in a state of disbelief. Allah also revealed, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ Verily you, O Muhammad, cannot guide those whom you love. Two short months after the passing of his beloved uncle, the Prophet experienced yet another personal tragedy. His beloved wife, Khadija, the mother of the believers, the first mother of the believers, passed away in Ramadan of the same year, the 10th year of Al-Hijrah at the age of 65. For 25 years, Khadija had shared the bitter and the sweet of life with the Prophet ﷺ and had supported him during the great trials and hardships that accompanied the first 10 years of prophethood. The Prophet never fully got over her death and mourned her long after her passing and mourned is a fancy word that means the Prophet continued to be sad and saddened by her passing even years after she had passed away. Once, long after her passing, he was reminded of her. Someone mentioned her name or mentioned a place where they, had, they used to sit together or mentioned a family member of hers. Something was said that reminded the Prophet of Khadija. And he said in a sincere burst of emotions, she believed in me when the rest of the people belied me. She affirmed my truthfulness when others called me a liar. She shared her wealth with me and supported me financially when others denied me financial support. She gave me children by Allah's permission while, while he did not will that I be born children by my other wives. Because of these two tragic events, the death of Abu Talib, and the death of Khadija, which occurred so close together and had a, very had a very serious impact on the Prophet and his prophetess. We're going to see that these, the death of these two pillars of support of the Prophet had a profound impact on the trajectory of his prophethood. Because of these two events, the death of Khadija and the death of Abu Talib, the tenth year of prophethood is known as Am al huzn the year of sorrow. What lessons can we learn from what we heard today? Now, number one, the evil effect of bad companions. Abu Talib in his heart, he knew Islam was the truth. He knew the Prophet was truly the messenger of Allah. But when those two bad companions came and they shamed him, they shamed him for even thinking about leaving the religion of his forefathers. Because of their shaming and the fear of the shame, Abu Talib remained a mushrik, although he knew that Islam and Tawheed were true. This shows you the evil effect that bad companions can have on a person. A person can know what's right, but bad companions, I'm sorry, bad companions can convince him 
to do the wrong thing. Which is why the Prophet said, A person will follow the faith of his closest companion, so choose your friends wisely. Number two from the lessons, the evil effect of pride and being overly concerned with perceptions. What led to Abu Talib's downfall? He was a good man who had done good things for Islam that many believers could not even claim that they had done for Islam. He had supported Islam in a way that many believers at that time and today cannot claim. What was his downfall? Pride and being overly concerned with perception. He was too worried about what people were going to say. We can never let that deter us from doing the right thing. Worried about what people are going to say, that if that deters us, if we let that get into our head, and we worry too much about that, we are going to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing more often than not. Number three from the lessons, accepting Allah's judgment and decree. The Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to pray for his uncle Abu Talib, but he was told by Allah it is not proper to ask Allah's forgiveness for the idolaters even though they be kinsmen, after it has become clear to them that they are dwellers of the fire. And so the Prophet accepted that, even though I'm sure it stung. He wanted to pray for his uncle, but he was told not to do it, and he didn't do it. This is important for us as believers, that sometimes we really want to do something. And our religion tells us we can't do it. It's not allowed. It's not permitted. And that's a test to see, are we going to submit? Are we going to surrender? Are we going to accept Allah's decree or are we going to defy Allah and, and insist on having it our way? The Prophet is showing us by his, his excellent example, his gold standard example, the greatest role model who ever lived, showing us the, how a believer is supposed to behave when he's told to do something by God which is bitter to him. He accepts it. He swallows that bitter pill and does as he's told and does not defy Allah. Number four from the lessons. That it is okay, it is perfectly, perfectly permissible if we have non-believing relatives. It is perfectly permissible for us to have a natural love for them, to love them naturally. This is allowed. Because the Prophet was told by Allah, إِنَّكَ لَا تَحْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ O Muhammad, you cannot guide the ones you love. Allah is tacitly approving of the Prophet's love for Abu Talib. This was his uncle. He loved him as a relative and loved him as a, a ardent supporter. And that was okay. It was permissible. And so some of us have non-Muslim relatives. We have a non-Muslim mother, father, brother, sister, aunts, uncles. And we love them. And we might ask ourselves, is it okay to love them because we're Muslims and they're not Muslims? Yes, you can love them. A natural love is permitted. Although the religious love is reserved for the believers. Number five from the lessons. A strong religious man benefits greatly from the support of a strong religious woman. And this is important for couples to understand that sometimes, in many cases, a man is only as good as the woman who's what? Who's behind him and vice versa. And so couples have to work hard to support each other in their journey to Allah and help each other get better. And sometimes it means saying things that the person doesn't like to hear, but they need to hear because we have to support each other in our journey to Allah and getting closer to Allah and becoming better believers day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number six from the lessons is that the way to a religious man's heart is through that support. The Prophet spoke about Khadija in a way that he didn't speak about any of his other wives. Why? He tells us in that statement that we mentioned that he said when he heard when, when her name was mentioned, he said she believed in me when the rest of the people belied me. She affirmed my truthfulness when others called me a liar. She supported me with her wealth when other people denied me their financial assistance. That support won her a place in the Prophet's heart that none of the other women could claim. And so it's critical for us as husbands and wives to be that rock and pillar of support. And that is what all of us want to be loved by our spouses. That is what is going to earn us the love of our spouse. If that spouse is truly religious, that is what's going to make, earn us a spot in that person's heart that can't be what? That can't be changed. And then last but not least, from the lessons number seven, the people in our lives are gifts from Allah 
on loan from Allah. Let me say that again. The people in our lives are gifts from Allah on loan from Allah. Your wife, your husband, your brother, your sister, your grandma, your grandpa, your uncle, your aunt, your friends, close friends, best friends. These people are gifts from Allah on loan from Allah. Appreciate them while they're with you, while they're in your possession, while you have the chance to tell them, I love you, I care about you, you mean so much to me. Tell them those things and more importantly, show them those things. Because why? Because at some point Allah is going to what belongs to him. He's going to come and claim those people that he loaned to you and gave you as a gift. And when he comes to claim what belongs to him, you have no right to complain because it wasn't yours in the first place. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ is showing us in his practical example. And this is something that we all have to learn. Appreciate the people that you love. Hug them. Kiss them. Um, tell them how much you love them and how much you care while they're with you. Because they won't be there forever. And when they're gone, we have no right to complain about their passing. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك النبي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.